You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is June 15, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Patient Management Conference. Our presenter is Dr. Sunina Argo. She's an Allergy Immunology Fellow at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. So, uh, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we have two conferences today. Uh, our first one will be a patient management conference, be led by Dr. Sunina Argo. Uh, at 11 o'clock, Dr. Federley uh, has agreed to uh, uh, lead us in an allergy journal club, and we'll be reviewing two ar- articles from the medical literature. So, without any further delay, I'll go ahead and turn the podium over to Dr. Argo. Um, here's the keyboard. Um, here's the presentation. So, take okay. it away, Dr. Argo. All right. So we have a three-year-old white female who presents with rash and fever for 10 days. Um, so the history of present illness is that about 10 days prior to admission, she had swelling around her left eye. Uh, she had this progressed with worsening swelling, and she also had congestible injection and drainage. She began having fevers of 100 to 101 degrees Fahrenheit. So on the second day, um, she her BCP diagnosed with oral cellulitis, and they treated her with amoxicillin clavulanate. On the fourth day of taking this medication, so about five days into her illness, she developed a rash on her trunk and lower back. Within hours, the rash spread to her whole body. Her VCP recommended discontinuation of the amoxicillin clavulanate and prescribed azithromycin to continue treatment of the orbital cellulitis. Um, she took this medication for three more days, but she was seen back in her PCP's office because she wasn't having improvement in the rash and she continued to have fever. Um, parents were told that she might have adenovirus, that so they should continue to monitor. Two days later, so about 10 days now, she's been ill, that she had fever up to 104.8 degrees per night. She started developing blisters or pustules, and this is because dad said one thing, mom said the other thing, um, on her palms and nail beds, and so she was brought to CMH staff for further evaluation. Uh, concurrently with this, with the fevers and the rash, she had been having rhinorrhea, cough, decreased activity, decreased PO intake and urine output. Um, she also had some vomiting, a little bit of diarrhea, uh, didn't complain of any muscle or joint pains or increased work of breathing. She, her past medical history is only significant for some atopic dermatitis. Her history was uncomplicated. She's had no hospitalizations, no surgeries. Medications include daily meals of vitamin. Um, the only drug allergies or adverse reactions are to possible penicillin, secondary to the amoxicillin clavulanate, as per the history of present illness. Um, immunizations are up to date. Family history, mom has some seasonal allergies. Brother has a history of wheezing, but he's never diagnosed with asthma. Um, the family lives in Kansas with uh, a two-year-old brother, mom and dad, um, dogs in the home, <coughs> smokers. The child is in preschool. So based on this limited sort of initial history, what other questions would you have? What else do you want to know about her symptoms? Um, does she have ill contact to the daycare? Um, the way I was sensitive? Well, I can't uh, assume stuff had been going around, but nothing in particular that they noted. And the family was all doing okay. Okay, so there's no, there's no uppers of hand foot and mouth or anything? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although I kind of assume that daycare is one giant contact with illness. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, so some of the ones I thought were important to know is what time did the rash begin in relationship to the dose of medication? What kind of rash was it? Um, any other symptoms of anaphylaxis since the BCP recommended stopping the antibiotic? What other um, symptoms that she might have had that the parents didn't necessarily describe? Did the rash change when she was put on the uh, It Well, it kind of progressed over time, but nothing that they could pinpoint to change in the antibiotics. Um, she? Not really. Not very I don't much. think she was having a big reaction. So no. I'm, not, I'm not worried about the dose of the medication and the time and all yep. that, because I don't think it had anything to do with the right. antibiotic. I think she's experiencing a viral symptom. Yep, and it's always important, I think, to ask those questions to sort of prove to the parents. So um, she did take the, do- the the initial dose, the dose that morning, an hour before the rash developed, but again, she had been on the antibiotic for four days. She was also having concurrent illness. 
Uh, the rash was described as erythematous and macropapular, so very nonspecific. There were no hives. There were no other symptoms of anaphylaxis. Again, although she had vomiting and diarrhea, it wasn't concurrent with uh, an acute episode after the medication was taken. Um, further questioning of the parents, I found out that uh, they thought maybe she had some swelling of her hands and feet initially. They really didn't think about it until later they noticed that she was blood swollen. Um, she was pretty fussy at home. Um, she didn't have any problems bearing weight or anything despite the swelling. Yeah, given the vesicles, I think it was Coxsackie virus was the one that I would vote for. And there weren't, uh, and so that was kind of, you know, like I said, the parents, one said bullet, one said uh, pustules, and it really, it wasn't either. Uh, to be honest with you, so we'll kind of go on, but uh, her physical exam, um, so some significant findings are, are in red. She had minimal bilateral conjunctival injection. Her eye that was supposedly had the herbal her cellulitis, there was no edema or any cellulitic period, no erythema, tenderness, anything like that. She did have 1.5 centimeter anterior cervical lymph node on the right side. Um, she didn't have any hepatosplenomegaly. Her rash further it, at the this is the point at which we saw her. Um, she had desquamation of the skin on her trunk, arms, and legs, significant cirrhosis. She had a few small areas of maxillopapular rash on the dorsum of her feet, and some healing blisters on the palms of her hands. Mm, desquamation, huh? Mm -hmm. Because membrane involvement? Um, again, uh, we'll, we'll get there, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, in the EED here at, at, or at Children's Mercy South, she had, uh, again, some significant findings here in red. So one plus leukocytosis in her urine as well as greater than 100 WBCs. Um, her white count was elevated at 14,000. Her hematocrit was a little bit low at 28. Um, platelets were a little bit elevated at 482,000. She had an absolute eosinophil count of 620, and that's about 4.5% eosinophil. Uh, her sedimentation rate uh, was 82. Her potassium was a little bit low, her C-reactive protein was 13.1, and her ALT was 162, no bump in her AST. Um, they got some ASO titers that were negative and some EBV titers as well, not significant. Um, patient was admitted to the hospital, just kind of as a trend, her C-reactive protein ended up decreasing to 5.5, her ALT is now um, almost normal, 54. Um, her white count actually increased to 17,000. Her hematocrit continued to drop. It remained stable, though, around 23. Platelets, again, still mildly elevated, but not significant increase. Her eosinophil count increased to over 1,000, um, but again, about 6% eosinophilia. Um, rapid strep was done in the ER, negative. The follow-up throat culture was done, which is also negative. Blood culture was negative. Urine culture had a couple of positives, but again, not significant number of colonies, and it was mixed flora. Um, the respiratory viral panel PCR was negative. So it so wasn't a calf urine? Um, no, she's three. So, yeah. Well, she would have done a clean calf if she was three. Do you know what viruses Usually are? over two. Um, they do like parainfluenza, RSV, um, influenza, I don't remember if they, I think they do adeno, um, and I think they have Coxsackie, but I'm not sure if that one did, it has all the complete one that they did. Um, she has a, a hundred white cells in her, her urine. Yeah, really and not have, yeah, well, and you'll kind of see how that plays a part. So um, thoughts at this point, like from what you've seen, labs and all, we'll go into more detail. Some kind of viral thing. Did you didn't say before, did the rash wax and wane, or is it pretty much fixed? No, it it, it just, yeah, it progressed. So it didn't wax and wane. It was fixed, but then with the progression and sort of changing. You know, I'm concerned about the desquamation. I mean, is it to see something as like a Stevens-Johnson syndrome or a TBN mm -hmm. or any address syndrome, like mm -hmm. drug-related eosinophilia with systemic symptoms mm -hmm. type of thing? Or? Yep. So while she was a patient, this is kind of the differential diagnosis that uh, teams were taking care of her. So viral infection, adenosis of possible mono, even though EBV ties were negative. Uh, fever of unknown origin, she had you know, about 10 days of fever. Um, from an allergies perspective, they were worried about whether this is a delayed reaction, sort of a uh, drug eruption from penicillin, drug syndrome. Kawasaki's disease were also, was also um, in there. Did she have fever? Like Every, like for five consecutive days, or like was it on? I mean, all, all like time. nine days, I believe. So it, their fever was all really quickly. 
Whoa, wait a minute. I just want to check. I just want to check something really quick. Okay. Um. Okay. So yeah, she had it for the rest of the day. Okay. Um. Okay. So her hospital course, multiple specialties were consulted: ID, Clin Farm, cardiology, ophthalmology, derm, us, and room. So basically, the whole gamut of uh, of specialties. That's in order of when they were consulted. Yeah, it actually is. We were kind of the last one. You sure were. Well. Uh, us in rheumatology, yeah. Durham was maybe right before us. Um, so we were consulted because they were concerned about stress syndrome, um, secondary to the moxicillin clavulanate, and they were also worried about if it wasn't stress syndrome, did she have concern for you know, penicillin and or azithromycin drug allergy. Uh, so on a, the night of admission, um, she had uh, she received a dose of IVIG and high dose aspirin for suspected Kawasaki's disease. So. Some of the things that I didn't mention earlier were that on the initial exam, so again, not our exam because we saw her about three days in, um, she did have sort of some erythematous lips, some uh, not quite, didn't exactly say strawberry tongue, but you know, her tongue was definitely very red. Um, she had the conjunctival injection that we still noticed. Um, again, the edema of her extremities and then this rash and the lymph nodes. So they were thinking primarily Kawasaki. Um, and I'll tell you the reason that they got us involved. Is there a diagnostic test for Kawasaki's now, or is it still mm -hmm. state oh, clinical? It's, it's still it's the clinical, clinical. You, yeah. If I think you have it, you have it yeah. kind of thing. Exactly. Really think and it. the problem with that is that it's also a diagnosis of exclusion, so you have to go through all of this. You know, I mean, if you have the key features, you can surely diagnose it, but you still, most ID people feel like you need to rule out other types of infections and things that can have very similar presentations. Um, so, and I'll tell you why this sort of progressed, but um, basically they initially got an echocardiogram and it was negative, there was no coronary artery involvement. So if you have coronary artery dil dilatation or ectasia, I mean that, and, and these classic symptoms, then it's a shoe in, you can definitely call it Kawasaki. So that kind of made it a little bit difficult for the team. Um, like I mentioned, they got out the malogy consult because of the conjunctivitis, they were worried about uveitis, but she didn't have that. And so even after the first dose of IVIG, she continued to be febrile, which is, occurs that is a little bit atypical. Usually they defervesce after a dose of IVIG. So that's why they decided to get a lot of the other specialties involved to see if there was something else going on. Um, but given all of the history and the story and all the, the lab abnormalities, everybody really felt like this was still Kawasaki's disease and not trust syndrome. Um, so she got a second dose of IVIG and she did defervesce after this. Her inflammatory markers and transaminases improved as we saw her CRP went down or AS, ALT resumed. Uh, went back to normal. Um, so she was discharged home two days later on six weeks of aspirin therapy and cardiology and ID follow-up. So the parents were told that it's Kawasaki's disease? Mm -hmm. So, um, but again, since the, the features are very similar to dress syndrome, I thought this would be a time to review dress syndrome and then we'll talk a little bit about at the end about Kawasaki's too and why um, she fits more into the Kawasaki picture, although it, um, there are definitely some Maybe she's got Overlap. a third, guy, a third syndrome that hasn't been discussed. A combination of two. <laughs> kind of Argo syndrome. That's right. Well, and I'll share something, an interesting case at the end as well that we should a little bit surprising. Um, so dress syndrome, also known as drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Um, certain clinicians feel that the, very, the skin involvement is very variable, and so the name was suggested to be changed to drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, but I think most people still refer to it as drug rash. Um, so it's a severe idiosyncratic drug reaction. Uh, there are many names for this syndrome. Initially in the 1960s, the most common medications, and still are, um, were anticonvulsants. So it's called anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome. Um, later, as we started to discover that other drugs were involved, it was shortened to hypersensitivity syndrome. Uh, somewhere in there, somebody decided drug hypersensitivity. In about 1996, DRESS was coined. Um, and then because of the organ involvement, I guess people weren't satisfied with systemic symptoms, so there came about drug-induced delayed multi-organ hypersensitivity syndrome. Um, and kind of a newer one is drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. And this and DRESS are used somewhat interchangeably, although there are still people who uh, feel like these are more on a spectrum, sort of like SJS and TEN, and that maybe um, DIHS is a little bit more severe than DRESS. But um, we'll kind of talk about them as one and, and illustrate a little bit of what people think is yeah, a little the bit acronym of, The acronym DRESS is so appealing, it'll never go away. <laughs> so you'll, you'll see it called all those things. Because it's a word that you can pronounce. Right. Um, 
So this is it's the most the most common uh, medications that cause stress syndrome are aromatic anticonvulsants and sulfonamides. Um, there's a long latency period of two to six weeks, and this, along with the variable clinical symptoms, really can uh, lead to diagnostic delay. The incidence is about one in one thousand to one in ten thousand drug exposures. Um, and the mortality is actually 10 percent. This is typically secondary to liver damage. Um, there's typically eosinophilic infiltration of the liver that uh, leads to this damage. So the clinical features, um, rash uh, thought to occur in about 70 percent of patients, but again, the pattern varies. You'll hear many just different descriptions. There's not really a classic rash for dress syndrome. Um, fever greater than 38 degrees centigrade, uh, lymphadenopathy, hematologic abnormalities, and this can be most commonly eosinophilia in about 50% of patients, but um, you can also see atypical lymphocytosis. Uh, there's usually at least one internal organ involvement. Again, the liver is most common as we saw in our patient, um, and that's why they were suspecting dress syndrome, so that occurs about 60%. Uh, kid followed by kidneys, heart, and lung. There's also some sort of more isolated reports of brain, thyroid, and pancreas being involved. She only had one liver enzyme and that was elevated. Yep. It wasn't, it came down quickly. Yep. Which um, is another reason that she didn't yeah. have the bit. And, her, and the essential count went up to 1,000, but it's only 6%, 5% is normal. Yep. So up to 5% is normal. So. I mean, it wasn't a really high yeast. The, 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 and the yeast involved count, and we'll go when we get through the diagnosis, um, they base some of it on absolute, absolute count. And so when hers went up, she fit one of the criteria, but more strict criteria kind of have a higher yeast interval count, and then they suggest things like 12% and things like that for their uh, percentages. Um, you can also have... The other thing is that she had one, she had one kind of small node. And that was on my exam. A couple of days earlier, they felt like she had had some inguinal lymphadenopathy. I mean, she had some shoddy lymphadenopathy on the other side. I, you know, I wasn't completely impressed because, again, they were all very small nodes, which um, typically in, in dress syndrome you'll see more in large nodes. Um, they can also have facial edema, and this is actually often mistaken for angioedema. Uh, so as you can tell, several of these symptoms also look like infections, so it's very difficult to kind of go through this between Kawasaki's and uh, which is more uh, dress and infections. So. so the rash is usually pretty extensive. It's very symptomatic. Again, here are some examples of things that um, are described. Urticated macular papular eruption are probably the most common, but anything from vesicles, bullae, pustules, uh, chelitis, purpura, target lesions, erythroderma can be described, so it can be very vague. Um, the rash can progress to an exfoliative dermatitis, so again, Dr. Portner, you were mentioning that when we talked about her desquamation. Here are a couple of examples of some of the rashes in dress syndrome. The initial top one is sort of like the mac macular papular uh, erythematous rash. Um, the figure below that kind of shows some facial edema. And then over to the right, you see some more like urticated plaques. So as for many things, the pathogenesis of dress syndrome is really um, uncertain, and there are a lot of theories out there. Um, one of them is that there's a failure of drug detoxification, so patients that are slow uh, acetylators. So this leads to an accumulation of toxic metabolites, and then that in turn leads to this inflammatory cascade and, and the symptoms of dress syndrome. Um, it's also thought that CD4 and CD8 T cells that are drug specific um, release IL-5 and then this leads to eosinophil activation and again to an inflammatory cascade. Uh, there is a genetic predisposition, as you can see, several of the, the most common drugs that are involved in dress syndrome. There are some HLA um, associations in certain populations. Uh, another big sort of theory, and, and a lot of research is going into this, is viral reactivation. Um, so uh, there's a thought that certain drugs like allopurinol and some anticonvulsants may have an immunomodulatory effect um, on the B cells, and therefore in some susceptible people, they will have a transient hypogammaglobulinemia, and then when they have this, that allows virus reactivation, some latent viruses that are um, around, such as HHV6, um, EBV, CMV, things like that. Um, Cano et al. actually enrolled four patients that were on allopurinol and had dress syndrome in a study where they evaluated their immunoglobulins. Um, and as you can see from figure one, the first and second columns, there's a statistically significant difference of the IgG and IgA levels uh, from the onset of illness to recovery. 
So again, sort of pointing towards that transient um, hypogamma globulin anemia. Toyhoma et al. demonstrate. So in that study, they did not do, like they didn't give immunoglobulins or anything, right, before recovery. Mm -hmm. This was just mm -hmm. kind of a natu natural progression. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Toyoma et al. demonstrated an association between delayed uh, drug-induced hypertensivity syndrome and human herpes virus 6 reactivation. They basically obtained serum samples from 100 people between 1998 to 2004 who had most of most of the symptoms, uh, one systemic symptom, rash, and ingestion of a drug that was commonly uh, caused, that commonly caused the syndrome, and they have ruled out any patients that had SGAs or TEN. Uh, they found a significant increase in the anti-HHV6 IgG antibody titer in 62 of those patients. Um, and the, these 62 patients had more severe symptoms, they had a prolonged outcome, and all of the deaths and causes of severe renal failure in those 100 patients were from the 62 that had an increase in their anti-HHV6 IgG antibody titer. Um, and then they went further to try to detect PCR, um, <clears throat> and they found this positive in about 18 of the patients, and in every single one of those 18 patients, they found that when their symptoms flared, they had more detection of the DNA PCR, so they did serial detections, um, and the main symptoms were the fever and then the kind of rising of their a AST and ALT Hepatitis. That doesn't really tell about causality, because the HHV can lie latent for long periods of time, and it right. could be that you've had it and the syndrome is causing a reactivation, or it could be that the reactivation is causing the syndrome. You right. don't really oh, know what the Right. Well, and they, they, so they concluded that, you know, HHV6 was a good diagnostic marker, and they felt that it was a good um, prognostic indicator, but again, this is still not widely accepted as one of the diagnostic criteria here, at least. It is, um, you'll see, in, in the Japanese uh, population. So differential, we talked about SJS, TEN, um, idiopathic hyperia synophilia, Kawasaki, some of the connective tissue diseases, viral hepatitis. Uh, they also mentioned acute generalized exanthematous pestulosis and staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. But those last two really, the, the rash and the appearance is very distinct. So those are even though they're on your differential, if you kind of um, well, look at those criteria, you're going to... Steph's called the skin, that goes very quickly. I had exactly. some patients of resident that within, you know, six hours they were um, a mess. So. Exactly, very septic and that had a lot of involvement. And the pustulosis is very prominent, and obviously in the other one, so... <clears throat> um, this is a table that kind of illustrates some of the similarities and differences between these common uh, disorders that are on the differential. Um, as you can see, there's a, a wide variety of uh, cutaneous features in all of them. Again, like we had mentioned, in dress syndrome, the edema, exfoliative dermatitis, the blisters, um, all the classic ones in Kawasaki, strawberry tongue, palmar erythema, uh, conjunct conjunctival injection. Um, really, eosinophilia is is not seen in SJSTEN or in Kawasaki's disease, although there were some reports in the literature that we read when evaluating this patient where some patients with Kawasaki's disease could have some eosinophilia. And again, it's not to the degree that you would expect, expect to see in drug syndrome. Um, adenopathy is pretty uh, common to all of them, as is other organ in involvement. And they're all pretty much similar, carditis, um, pericarditis, uh, pleuritis, all of that. Nephritis, so those can be very uh, similar. The thing is, there's not so many things, though, that cause blisters on the palms of the soles. So. Yeah. Uh, so some, although, again, DRESS doesn't really have any great diagnostic testing, uh, some laboratory evaluation that might be helpful. So CPC with differential, and again, you'll be looking for the eosinophilia or the atypical lymphocytosis. Um, LFT to see if, and serum creatinine in your analysis to see if there's any internal organ involvement. Um, I mentioned earlier that there's some reports of uh, thyroid involvement, and so there's a small subset that, that get thyroiditis, and that's why TSH may be helpful, um, not something we did in our patient um, or that was done before. A skin biopsy can be done, but it's usually not very helpful. It's pretty nonspecific, as most are. Um, but occasionally, um, and, and you'll see that typical lymphocytic infiltrate, but occasionally you can see eosinophils, and it may be denser than other drug reactions. And then also you can see some atypical lymphocytes occasionally. So if you get that, it might be more helpful, but it's not always going to be the case. Um, and then because of all the 
talk about viral reactivation. You can get viral titers or DNA PCR. So again, commonly uh, common ones are EBV, CMV, HHV6. So this is uh, sort of some diagnostic criteria for drug syndrome. Um, most of the things that we talked about, obviously you want to have a drug that you suspect, rash, fever, lymph nodes. This has lymph nodes at two sites, which again, our patient didn't have prominent, at least if she did, um, involvement of one organ, the hematologic abnormalities. Um, the thing that's different on here as well and compared to Kawasaki's disease is that the platelets are typically below the laboratory limits, whereas in Kawasaki's disease, they typically have a thrombocytosis in the subacute phase. Um, our patient looked like she was probably heading there. She wasn't, you know, five or 600,000, but she was definitely higher than normal and was getting into that two-week period where you typically see that in Kawasaki's disease. So you have to have three or four of the, three of the four criteria um, to have cow to have stress syndrome. Um, and then this is the Japanese consensus group that I was mentioning earlier that have a little bit different criteria for drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. And this is, again, a group that sort of thinks that this is a little bit more severe than dress syndrome. So um, the rash that develops greater than three weeks after the drug, so um, that latency period, um, prolonged symptoms after discontinuation. And again, these are two other things that didn't really fit with our patient. Um, her symptoms occurred supposedly four days after being on moxicillin, so you don't have that latency period that's pretty classic for one of these syndromes. Um, and she she got better very quickly. So after the first dose of IVIG, she had a lot of improvement in her rash um, by the time we had seen her, but still had some. And by the second dose, she was on her way to almost complete resolution within the next couple of days, whereas with drug syndrome, you would expect to see this go on for a few weeks. You know, with that long of a latency after the drug is stopped, how do you know the drug is associated with the disease? I mean, it could, could be that you get it randomly, and then you start saying, well, what drug was she on? And you find something to blame, but it may have nothing to do it, that I, I have a real problem with, it, with that kind of latency. Right. It, it makes it very hard to... I bet that the times when you don't find a drug, you just say, well, it's something else. And so it's a just so story. It's not really a factual thing. Yeah. Um, again, some of the other abnormalities are, are listed here. This is where they mentioned eosinophilia of greater than, uh, an absolute count greater than 1,500. Um, we'll look at another criteria that says greater than 700. So again, our patient kind of fell in between there, just depending on which one to go. And then because they have done all of this, this work with the human herpes virus 6, uh, they actually include that as one of their criteria. And you really have to have uh, all these criteria to meet drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. Does this kid have how many typical ones? Kid few. few. They didn't quantify percentage. So this is um, another set of diagnostic criteria from Registar. This is a European registry that um, looks at severe cutaneous adverse reactions. Uh, looks like they look at things like SJS, TEN, generalized exanthematous pestilosis, and dress syndrome. And this was particular for dress syndrome. It basically lists all of the symptoms. And then you assign a point value based on whether or not you have those symptoms. And it's, some of them are even broken down, like um, the eosinophil count. So again, this is the one where you get one point if the eosinophil count is somewhere between, absolute count is somewhere between 700 and 1499. If it's greater than 1500, then you get an extra point. So, um, and then the rash as well. So, it, it, they said rash suggesting dress, but again, I have yet to find um, something that's more classic for dress because there's just so many variable presentations. Uh, so, once you use this scoring, um, basically, if you get a final score of less than two, they say that you don't have a case for dress syndrome. If it's two to three, it's possible. If it's four to five, it's probable, and if it's greater than five, uh, it's a definite case. We gave our patient about four. Um, again, she sort of fit into that eosinophilia. Uh, the enlarged lymph nodes, yeah, again, it was just one, so I'm not sure that she gets all the credit for that. Uh, we took one away because she didn't have resolution greater than 15 days. She had much more rapid resolutions. You take away a point for that. So. I've never seen a scoring system with a minus. Yeah. That's weird. Um, so management of dress syndrome, uh, obviously you want to have early diagnosis so that you can withdraw the offending drug. And again, if the theory is that 
your uh, accumulating toxic metabolites, the sooner that you take it away, hopefully the, the less metabolites you have accumulated. Um, obviously, supportive therapy, antipyretics for fever, topical steroids for the rash. If you do progress to exfoliative dermatitis, they treat it like a burn with appropriate fluid resuscitation. Uh, the mainstay of treatment is systemic steroids, medium to high dose. Really couldn't find an exact on that. Um, and this is all pretty controversial. Um, not sure if it, if it helps as much. Um, it's thought, obviously, steroids are going to inhibit the effect of IL-5 on the eosinophil accumulation. And they've seen dramatic improvement in symptoms, and lab results have been uh, significantly reduced. And they've noted that when you taper or withdraw the steroids, people have had relapses. Um, but this is really more of a case report, not in randomized controlled trials. So it's very difficult to, uh, to know, but it's still what everybody does. Um, I think the other reason that it's somewhat controversial is because there's such an overlap between DRESS and SJS and TEN, and we know that in SJS TEN, it's uh, essentially contraindicated to use steroids because of the increased morb morbidity and mortality associated with sepsis. So, um, but regardless, this is still what Again, what's done. I would think of these as all anecdotes. These are all just like case reports, exactly, and so on. And you always hear the story about you know, you know a whole bunch of anecdotes does not make data. Well, these are anecdotes. These really aren't. Data. I'm intrigued by this early diagnosis allowing for withdrawal of offending drug. If you don't withdraw the offending drug, does it make any difference? Maybe or does again, everybody just always do it so we don't know? Yeah, it seems like every time you have something, um, and we'll talk about always just take away the drug. A review of the literature, but usually the the drug is stopped pretty quickly. Um, but I guess you said there was a latency of three weeks, so the drug might not even be on, and they still get it. So. How do we know that the drug has anything to do with it? I'm yeah. still and this is asking that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a heretical question, but I think it needs to be asked. Yeah. Do you think the eosinophilia helps, though, like going in the direction of allergy or something that related to drug? I, I don't know. Because because the eosinophils, eosinophils are clearly not, not specific there. It's not specific, drug. right? But would you kind of look into that direction more so if there, there is eosinophilia versus there's no eosinophilia? Once this guy's well, if you give him the drug back, does it always come back? Dress syndrome. Huh? In dress syndrome. If you had dress syndrome, re-exposure should... Um, so it does? Do it does now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That that's, be, that's more convincing. Right. Um, so other therapies, um, IVIG, Kano et al., um, are reportedly using IVIG in addition to steroids in patients with, again, this is a Japanese group that's very interested in the spiral reactivation. They think that if you give um, IVIG that it will have some antiviral immunoglobulin that will help, you know, fight off this virus that's being reactivated, and so that functional component will help. Um, they've had encouraging results reportedly, but uh, they actually haven't shown any suppression of the viral reactivation when tested, so this is not very... Um, not widely used. Uh, Jolly et al. actually concluded that IVIG had a poor benefit risk balance. So they enrolled patients in a study in which they um, they, they chose, they, they were going to enroll 10, but I think uh, we're only able to get six. So they treated them with IVIG instead of corticosteroids. And five of them had adverse reactions, two had malaise during the infusion, which is a side effect of IVIG. One had hypotension, one had hypertension, also side effects. Um, and then one had a pulmonary embolism at day nine. Uh, basically, what they did is they treated with 200 milligrams per kg per day for five days of IVIG, and their endpoint was that by day seven, the patient would have no fever and no progression of their uh, syndrome and their symptoms, and then by day 30, they'd have complete resolution. So essentially, four of these patients, or sorry, five of these patients didn't make that. One did make it to the endpoint, but he was actually stopped early, um, secondary to safety concerns. Um, and of the five patients that had adverse reactions, they ended up getting them steroids for like rescue treatment, so they, you know, really kind of concluded that there's no point in doing IVIG because if patients needed steroids anyway to get better, and they had all these adverse effects from the IVIG infusion. Um, there have been some uh, some people who have tried N-acetylcysteine in case reports. Uh, again, going back to the theory of drug metabolite accumulation, uh, N-acetylcysteine will really help with this in the liver and detoxifying these drugs and breaking them down. So they thought, hey, why don't we try this? But unfortunately, they had some development of angioedema two to three days after starting this. And although angioedema is a part of DRESS syndrome, 
the rash was getting better and the angioedema appeared and was worsening, so they felt like it was really related to the NAC. So because of that, the fact that there's no randomized control trials, it's obviously not done and, and it's not really recommended. But it is a relatively um, safe medication. Otherwise, it's one of those that you always say it never really hurts to give, but in this case, because of the angioedema, they're really saying not to do it right now. Um, so of course, prevention is always a, an issue with management. So again, you want to start with a, a, a proper dose initially and slow dose escalation. So we know with like lamotrigine, you can get a severe rash, kind of like on the SJS spectrum, um, from when you start, start with a high dose or if you escalate the dose very rapidly. So the thought is that this may be, play a role in all of these types of syndromes. Uh, family counseling may be important because, again, there are some HLA associations and genetic predisposition. So something a little different than what we're used to with IgE mediated things where there's really not a, a great genetic link. Um, what would you tell them? And I think it's just if there's a history of it in the family, then that person needs to avoid that drug and possibly have HLA testing, especially for those like one of the ones that I mentioned was an HIV drug, and that's pretty commonly done now for a lot of HIV drugs because there are so many that cause, you know, these severe reactions. Um, but the other one was allopurinol, again, a medication that's used very commonly in the adult population for treatment of the gout. So I think if there's a family history and or, you know, you're, you belong to a population, a lot of these are like a Chinese population, a Thai population, so it may not be as relevant for here, but obviously as we have those immigrants here, um, it's something to think about in terms of whether they fit into that group of risk factors. Um, secondary prevention, again, avoidance of re-exposure because it is no undress syndrome that you'll have um, uh, symptoms appear again. You want to avoid any cross-reactive agents in case there is an association with, uh, with dress syndrome. And then there have been some re literature discussion reports of desensitization. Um, they often do this with Bactrim and HIV patients. It's an essential drug for them, and whenever they have some sort of rash, they do this. But again, I think it just depends on the situation and the significant morbidity and mortality of dress syndrome sort of steers everyone clear of trying to do this because it may not go very well and may lead to more severe reaction and it's not something like an IgE mediated reaction where you have the medicines to treat them. I mean there's you know steroids help but it, it sounds like the rash kind of take the, the syndrome kind of takes its course regardless. It just may shorten or prevent some things. So uh, <laughs> the American Journal of Medicine had a great review last year on dress syndromes. I thought it was worth kind of going through this to see if all the previous stuff that we talked about kind of compare that um, and what's new and out there because, again, this is all case-based. So uh, looking at that in a systematic way is probably the best thing to do. So they aim to classify case or cases that reported as either dress or DIHS by using the Registrar scoring system for the the European one that we looked at, looked at earlier. They did PubMed Medline search between January of 2007 and May of 2009. So they had initial 228 articles by using DRESS, DHS, drug hypersensitivity, and those common uh, search words. They took out 31 of those because they didn't have anything to do with drug sensitivity. So they were left with 197. And then from this, they excluded about 66 more that were either like group summaries, or they were reviews, or they didn't have enough data to really use in the comparison of this. So they ended up with 131 articles that they uh, looked at. And this led to 172 cases of drug syndrome. So what they found was that there were 44 drugs that were associated, the most common being, again, some of the anticonvulsants, allopurinol, um nivirapine. And actually, in the other drugs, over half of them were only associated with one case of drug. So they're still not that significant. If you look back in this, the penicillins were um, associated with one case of dress, and they were, uh, and it was one of those the possible or probable cases. It wasn't even one that was a definite case. So that's another reason in our patient, we really didn't feel like the amoxicillin fibulonate really was responsible for dress syndrome. It's not well, well known for that. Um, the majority of the cases that they found were either definite or probable. Less than 10% were pretty much not dressed based on that registrar data, even though that's they're classified as. Um, so I thought this was interesting that they found that skin rash was pretty much present in all cases, 97% of the time. Again, the, some of the other literature suggests about 70%. And, you know, like I mentioned, they wanted to change the name because they didn't think skin involvement was that important. But um, this review found that really it is. And I think it actually the other 3% where they didn't have skin rash. It was cases that, by the registrar data, they identified as really not even cases of dress. 
So it may be closer to 100% that really do have some skin involvement. Um, internal organ involvement was the second most common symptom with about 88%, and of those, 94% was liver abnormality, um, and that was defined as either hepatomegaly or elevation of the LFTs. And again, this really um, is another point. You know, one of the diagnostic criteria says that the liver function enzymes can be greater than 100, but this really says 9 to 10 fold increase, which, you know, if the normal is around up to 50, you know, that's a big increase where, again, our patient had a very, you know, maybe two, three times normal and then back down to normal by the next day. So um, something that's a little bit different. Again, this just suggests that this is a much more severe disorder. Um, eosinophilia was the third most common. It was reported about 66% of the patients, and fever and latinopathy were right behind that at 64 and 56%. Um, going back to the HHV6 thing, um, this was actually, say that again? Um, this one defined it as the greater than uh, 700, like absolute count greater than 700. I mean, I don't get it. If you find the syndrome as a syndrome in which you have eosinophilia, wouldn't 100% of people observed with the syndrome have it? And that's the, I mean, so I think, the way you define it. And that's so the it's thing. Sort of an after, yeah, this is sort of a foretold, foregone conclusion. Right. Well, and they did find that, you know, Again, several of the cases were on the, based on, they went back using this registrar data, so who knows what people were using. That didn't to, require eosinophilia? No, that did, which is why they were finding that right. only 60% of it did, but who knows what the people who had diagnosed them with DRESS before were calling it. And again, he found a lot of cases, this review found a lot of cases that they really didn't feel like were DRESS syndrome, even though that's what they were identified as. So I think this is um, a good review to see that you know, you really have to have these criteria because they're present in such a majority of the patients that if you don't have that, you really can't diagnose this. I think it's something, you know, and again. I call it a different syndrome. Right. Find something else to call it. Um, so they, uh, in terms of herpes, human herpes virus 6, they actually only checked it in less than half the cases that this review looked at. Um, but of the ones that they looked at, like 70 patients, 80% of them had an increase in their titer in getting reactivation. Now, they didn't specify what, how much of an increase. Yeah, well, so they did that when they first um, diagnosed them and then followed up with the titer? Yeah, or? this doesn't. This because doesn't I, because the thing is, that's a fairly common virus, and so what's your baseline titer before you can get sick? Right. You know? And that's why I think it's more important if they're, you know, you want to do this. Like, so the, the group that did the PCRs, because they're looking at, you know, detectable levels, like serial levels, because even titers can not be as accurate, and so it's kind I mean, of comparing like models all models that they go up and they come down again, or right. whatever sort of thing. Right. So, so the thing is, hyperacam is an acute pain reactor. Yeah. So. Uh, they didn't find an association between internal organ involvement and the type of drug that was thought to cause stress syndrome. All patients were hospitalized. Um, this is what we were talking about earlier, Dr. Portnoy. All patients' drugs were continued within the first days of hospitalization. So it's pretty typical that as soon as you have any suspicion that the drug is discontinued. Uh, the main treatment was corticosteroids. In about 10 cases of these 172 um, patients also received IVIG. One problem with this review was that in the case reports, the doses and routes of administration of corticosteroids was not identified, so you couldn't really figure out if everybody was using the same dose, if they were using the same route, if they felt like you know, that made a difference at all in outcome. You couldn't tell because it wasn't standard. And that's actually something, like I mentioned before, in the literature, I really couldn't find anybody that defined a dose. They just said a medium to high dose, and nobody really kind of, there's not a consensus on that. Did you say this happened three weeks after the drug was discontinued? Two to six weeks, yep. Then what does it mean to discontinue? You already are off the offending drug, aren't you? Not always. Not always. Like once they were hospitalized with symptoms, it was discontinued and yeah, they've been in. This review, yeah. apparently, it's people who are still on the drug who are hospitalized. And um, that other thing is more of an epidemiologic observation. Right. Uh, recovery was anywhere from six and a half to plus or minus nine and a half weeks. They did find in these 172 patients that nine cases resulted in deaths from cardiac or hepatic causes. Um, Corticosteroids did not present this outcome. They didn't really find any significant differences between the demographic, clinical, and outcome parameters in the patients who died versus recovered, although they did note that there was a trend that the patients who died were a little bit older. It wasn't statistically significant. Why would you get a cardiac? Why would you get a cardiac? 
They can have eosinophilic, uh, the, the thought is that the internal organ involvement is from eosinophilic infiltration. Acute. And so you can get like pericarditis, you can get, get, just the way you get like hepatitis and nephritis, you can get always also get pneumonitis, you can get carditis, you can get yeah, all of these. Okay. It's more evolved, yeah. So is part of the screening thing, is the echo recommended or, is, or EKG or something? For, for dress syndrome, mm -hmm. not one of the... Oh, I'm sure. The, um, the other thing is, I mean, what are the, uh, this has always, uh, I guess, been some concern about, what are the criteria that you say, okay, now you're better enough, you're, you're well enough to be discharged from the hospital, you're saying this is six to nine weeks. So I know Chrissy had a patient that they've been on multiple, you know, drugs and holistic things and developed um, dress syndrome and never, I'm not sure they ever really figured out what it was, or it was multiple drugs, but um, I know that kid was here for a while, but I don't remember the kid being here for nine weeks or whatever, so right. I guess what's, you know, uh, this is something that's been very unclear to me, is so, like, what are the clinical criteria that says, okay, now it's safe you to go home, I'm not going to worry about hepatitis or heart disease or you having a fatal arrhythmia or something. Right. And, also and there's, there are right. Right. And, and there's not a great, um, <laughs> 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 and they have insurance or not. As for most things, there's not a great um, like curve of how things go. You know, do their transaminases go up to the maximum amount and then just drop, and then that would be a good indicator, or do they kind of vary? I mean, some of the patients that we talked about earlier, the whole point was that they were having relapsing disease, so they would, you know, have fever and then get better, and then transaminases get better and they would get worse. And so I think that you know, I don't know if there's a nobody has defined criteria in terms of how many days you need to be fever free, how many days you need to have your transaminases be normal, but I assume that those are probably the two most common. That and, and the rash are probably the three top things that you're looking for improvement in, but I think it's very subjective and, you know, when you feel like the patient's better and, and I think obviously close follow-up is, is something you'd want to... You're definitely, you're tapering, you're going to be tapering steroids over a long period of time and I know that patient with Christie's that there was issues where the the patient was being tapered and then had a flare and then she got put back up on steroids again right. and then came back down and right. it was a very long, drawn out but process. But have that even without any drugs in one hospital. Yeah. At the end. Right? Oh, she'd been taking out medications. Yeah, she was having, she was, um, she was having some flares and so they're just all part of the, because it's a, you know, six to nine weeks. Um, is it just part of the process of recovery that you're going to wax and wane and may have some flares? It's a relapsing and yeah. My guess is well, and this says like it's like six plus or minus nine weeks, so it can be like a couple months versus it could be. Yeah. Just My guess is that the length of hospitalization was probably longer, longer ago, and shorter more recently because 20 years ago we would wouldn't bat an eye keeping people in the hospital for months. Now we're more cost, we're more comfortable with home care. So that's yeah. part of it too. I think regardless of that serial evaluation of their, you know, rash, fever, and and their uh, whatever abnormality they have in terms of working life is important. The other thing I think Chris's patient I think was somewhat um, had some problems with feeding and some anorexia just from the illness sort of thing. So I guess that's another issue. Are they, you know, are they able to eat, drink, and you know, do they have a lot of abdominal pain or whatever sort of thing? Right. Absolutely. Your patient did get there. No, no, no. Yeah, that was what they, after the first dose of IDIG, they want to know, is it stress? So should we add steroids? And we said, we don't think it's stress. You shouldn't add steroids because steroids are not indicated in Kawasaki. The second dose of IDIG is what's indicated. That's what they did. She got better. Um, so after looking through all these 172 cases, they defined them into two groups, either the probable definite, again, based on the registrar data, or the no possible. Um, and they did a multivariate logistic regression to look at the, the most common symptoms that we talked about, and they found that all of the most common ones, fever, hyperosinophilia, liver involvement, and lymphadenopathy, were significantly associated with the probable definite cases. So, um, and then also atypical lymphocytosis um, was statistically significant. You can see these key values here. 
So I just wanted to throw up the slide of the diagnostic criteria for Kawasaki's disease, because again, that was so, um, has similar symptoms. So obviously the big ones, the erythematous rash, the lymph node, but again, in Kawasaki's you really just have to have one lymph node. You probably need to have multiple areas for dress syndrome. Um, fever is the other one. So those three are pretty common um, or, or similar in the two groups. Conjunctival injection is a separate one. Again, our patient had that, not necessarily the case in dress syndrome, but you know, you could. Um, mouth changes, so again, the lip crusting, the erythema, the oropharynx, along with strawberry tongue. Um, the peripheral extremity is, is also another big criteria, so the swelling, the palm and sole involvement, and then the eventual desquamation. Um, you have to have five of six of these criteria. Basically, you need to have all five and then fever greater than five days to secure the diagnosis of Kawasaki's disease. Other things that will help you um, and that our patient had was a normochromic anemia, if you remember her crit went down to about 22. Uh, Leukocytosis greater than 15,000 with less shift, which she also had. Elevated CRP and ESR. Thrombocytosis, which I think she was on her way to having. Um, hypoalbuminemia, which she initially had. And the sterile pyuria, you're asking about that. It's actually pretty commonly seen in Kawasaki. So, um, so those are other things that sort of, again, pushed us towards, besides the timing um, of Kawasaki. So um, an interesting case report, uh, Kawakami et al. report a case of a two-year-old Japanese boy who had Kawasaki's disease who was treated with IVIG and high-dose aspirin therapy. Uh, he improved and aspirin discontinued a month later. About five weeks after the initial presentation, he was seen again for fever, variable lymph adenopathy, and a macular papular rash that was pruritic. They were concerned for infection, so treated him with amoxicillin and some other medications for symptomatic uh, improvement. He had an elevated white blood cell count to 15,000 with 8% atypical lymphocytes and 12% eosinophils. His AST was 165, his ALT was 187. All blood, urine, uh, stool cultures were negative. He had hep A, hep B, EBV, HIV, and CMV um, were all negative. He had a skin biopsy that showed lymphocytic infiltration with partial liquefaction degeneration of the basal cells uh, over time. <laughs> Lymphocytic infiltration, possibly drug, who knows. Um, lymphadenopathy became more generalized with larger and more tender nodes. His liver functions continued to deteriorate. He was treated with methylprednisolone and oral prednisone. I'm not sure why both at the same time. Um, his fever and skin lesions improved slowly, and the steroids were tapered over two months. His anti-HHV6 IgG titer increased from 1 to 160 to 1 to 10,240 over the previous three weeks. He made, met the full diagnostic criteria for a drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome by the Japanese consensus group. After two months off steroids, he had patch testing and LTP to all the drugs he had been on, so amoxicillin, aspirin, everything. Both tests were positive for aspirin, and they diagnosed him with aspirin-induced hypersensitivity syndrome after treatment of Kawasaki disease. Mm -hmm. So kind of unusual in that they're very similar uh, entities and makes you kind of go back and wonder if the initial presentation really fit, but, you know, again, he had never had problems with aspirin before. He fit more of the criteria for Kawasaki. He's got treated with aspirin, and then the aspirin, which is not a common one that's known, uh, ended up causing this. Actually, his liver functions didn't really increase that much. Well, that was the initial. They didn't oh. report. They said they worsened. So they were at 165 and 180 initially, and then they just kind of continued to get that, but they didn't give the numbers. So. I thought that was interesting. So in conclusion, dress syndrome is a severe reaction. Typically occurs two to six weeks after an initiation of a drug. Um, again, the most common symptoms that you really got to have all of are rash, internal organ involvement, eosinophilia, fever, and lymphadenopathy. Can have the atypical lymphocytosis. Uh, you want to withdraw the drug, supportive care, and really steroids. Again, plus or minus IVIG, which is really not being used and probably not recommended for the most part. Um, and then you typically take resolution within weeks. So uh, just a couple of questions that I found. I didn't really do them in, uh, at the beginning, pre and post, just so we didn't know what the diagnosis was. But um, which is one of the following act infective agents has been implicated in the pathogenesis of drugs? Probably. A. A. Yep. I heard this a couple times. The following um, all form part of the diagnostic criteria for drugs except Yep. So they can have them, but there's no record, you know, required, and the, the size is also not essential. I think what they do is that, is that on the palms? It seems to describe more stuff on the palms than 
Yeah, because I just, I mean, I, I just think when I was doing your piece, there was, where I was told there was very few things that cause, you know, blisters on your palms. Uh, which of the following features distinguishes stress from a drug-induced exanthem? That, that latency of reaching two weeks, yeah. 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 And which of the following organs is with common people? Yeah. And maybe one more. Uh, the following treatment is indicated after yeah. CC2. Yes, zero. Okay. Initiation of the drug. So, so like the interesting part is a lot of drugs to be finished. And the medication could have already been, like, typically, what do you take for more than two weeks? You know, very few antibiotics you take for more than a seven to ten day course. And the principle of contact dermatitis or whatever is your ongoing exposure to the drug. Mm -hmm. You know, press is just to be and it sounds like a systemic contact dermatitis almost. Right. And, all that mm -hmm. and the weird part is that it stops the drug and you're still having it. So how but the other happen? thing that you have to think about, another point that I actually didn't uh, say when you guys were asking about, well, why would you have not stopped the drug? Most common drugs are anticonvulsants, alpurinol, so things that are not short term. So these patients are on them and on them and on them and on them for whatever time period and then develop the symptoms. You know what I mean? So it's not something that you would have stopped inherently versus an antibiotic, which are not really sulfonamides are indicated, but most of the other antibiotics are not the highest uh, causative agents of dress. So it's not going to be something that you took for short-term therapy. You're on allopurinol every day, or you're on the antipsychotic every day. So they leave it open. So that's why dress is infected in all kinds of conditions. Uh -huh. Even when they stop the drug, you know, like after two days, like the democracy. Right. Now this says that, yeah, this says that it should be suspected dress and all. One of the first diagnostic criteria said that it's a drug, like you have to have had a drug that you think cause the reaction. So you're right, like that kind of says that in a vague way yeah. that you need to have a drug that you think actually makes sense that you're on for. Like that's why this girl that we saw made no sense because yeah. she was on it for four days. Yeah. I mean, it's not... Yeah. Well, very interesting and quite quite puzzling. Yeah. Um, I think that a lot more research needs to be done, maybe better quality. The problem is that these uh, these episodes occur sporadically so there's right. no way to to get you can't do a randomized control. Right whatever, because there's no predicting and nobody's going to induce it in order to see an animal model might be helpful, I suppose, if you can get one. I mean, the other question patch test was really, you know, what did they Correct. use for the patch test? Yeah, yeah, yeah test might be worth it. I don't have patients with aspirin. Mm -hmm. so, Maybe we should uh, How do you know that patients who are on aspirin every day do not have positive patch Exactly. You know. We're going to have to stop here, but um, we're going to take a couple of minute break because everybody needs couple minute break and then we'll be back and Dr. Federley will be leading us in an allergy journal club. Yeah, you know she's so fine. stay tuned. Uh, we'll she's going to come back. back. I think she's back. Oh, yeah, recognize that last fight. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.